All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you all here and more specifically to dive into the Q&A podcast part one. Now I'm saying part one specifically because I had so many questions come in from all of you, which I can't tell you how much that filled my heart to have so many people tune in. My guides were pumped that so many of you had questions for them. And so it has been so much fun for me to sit down and chat with them and be like, how do we want to answer this? And so I love this. This brings me so much joy. So because there were so many questions, I am going to have to do this in part one and part two. And then also some of your questions I will be answering on the Making Sense of Life videos. So if you are listening to this just on an audio podcast platform, the Making Sense of Life videos that I do are you know, answers to different questions people have about spirit related stuff. And you can find that on my YouTube page, uh, Jeanette Biro Medium. As well, you can see them on my Instagram, Jeanette Biro dot medium, as well as Facebook, uh, the Avalon Spirit Facebook group. So those are three different places you can find a lot of like question answer things. Uh, so some of these questions I will answer on a video, but most of them I'm going to get through on today's podcast and the next part two. So let's get started, you guys. This, this is just great. Okay, so first question that came in was, how can we find our tribe, especially if a person is over 60? Now, this is a great question. And essentially, the answer is all about alignment. What feels aligned with who you are now? So it's kind of like, Throughout our lives, we go through many different phases of evolution, phases of growth, where we change the frequency of who we are, uh, hopefully, right? Hopefully we come in here and we grow until the moment we transition and pass on, because that's really what the soul desires generally. So it's about taking stock of who you are now. Once you really know who you are now, it's about really letting go of the old paradigms, old connections that say, hold you back, uh, no longer support where you're going. And that doesn't mean that all of them need to be cut off or anything like that, but it's just changing. Maybe if there's any that you're holding tightly to that don't serve you anymore, how can you shift them in which way can they be different to support you now, whether that be letting them go, shifting the dynamic in them so that you have more room to get to know who you are now and make space for the alignments, the people, and the tribe that will now suit the resonance of what you are. And so when we make that space, we actually connect with the universe and then set an intent out to the universe of what you want. And then that space allows the universe to drop in different things into your path, different people, community events, connections, all of that kind of stuff on your path. So once you've made that space, notice what is dropping on your path and take advantage of exploring those things. So say, for example, you've done a lot of energetic clearing and you notice a friend of yours is like, Hey, let's try a pottery class. And you're like, well, I'm not really into pottery, but this is interesting alignment. So maybe I'll try it out. And then in that pottery class, you find two like-minded individuals and then you guys end up meeting for coffee and they slowly become your tribe. There's beautiful ways the universe can help align that for us. So again, it's all about alignment, check into what feels aligned for you now, and then um, set that intent of like energy to find you. And it'll be amazing to see how that does blossom. All right, the next one is, uh, is there a leader, boss or judge on the other side? This is a great question because so much of our um, literature, even art, really depicts the idea of a judge, somebody, usually a man, uh, a white bearded man sitting on a throne on the other side, that is the judge of uh, you. When you cross over, they judge your worthiness. And we are to spend our lives, you know, repenting for things and hoping that we will be worthy enough to make the cut to, you know, spend the afterlife somewhere peaceful. Now, the reality of it, as I understand, so please do remember, this is as I have understood, and my journey is not everybody's journey. So it's really to take what resonates for you. But from talking to thousands of spirits through readings who have crossed over, 
The consistent theme has always been that it is not someone else that judges us, but rather we do a life review when we cross over and we review the way in which we interacted with people, the way we treated them, both good and bad from their perspective so that we have true understanding of ourselves. We also review the different juncture points in our lives and decisions we made. And then it's essentially us that judge, if we want to use that word, ourselves. And then from that point decide, okay, what should I work on next lifetime? What did I really accomplish in this lifetime? And you know, what parts did I miss? How can I refine going into my next life? And I'll say I had that very same experience when I had my near-death experience, when I did my life review of my blueprint with my guides, we went over everything that I'd done up until that point in my life, the triumphs and the pitfalls and reviewed it all to take stock of it. And it was many beings coming together to support me, to be, you know, people that I could chat with to, you know, run things by ideas, like a council, a group. And so really there are many beings on the other side, family members, ascended beings, angels, um, that help us on the other side to determine what are our next best steps. What do we need to do? Um, some would say there's a hierarchy, but I would say it would be more dependent on vibrational frequency. So for example, if we take the three guides of light, they are a light being frequency that is so ascended, they no longer require embodying. Um, so I think we could look at maybe the term hierarchy with that, but even that, I don't like to label it with that. It's more just for descriptive purposes. But really, essentially, there are many beings helping us grow on our journey. Some have had way more experiences than we are, so they may be very good guides on the other side. But the one thing that I would say is there isn't a singular way or a singular boss or judge like a man or woman, like I said, but there is a source love energy, a center point, a gathering point that pulls everything back to source, which is why I think source is a beautiful word, but it is also God, creator, universe, the he, she, the almighty is this is an energy of love in its most purest form. And so that is what we cross over and come back to. And that is something that I think we try so hard to qualify what God is, but I believe God source creator is something so much more than what we can actually conceptualize as humans that we try to label it as something that makes sense. So that's how I would answer that question. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, it's a great question. And I think it's something that humanity will ponder forevermore. I, I think it will always, our consciousness as it expands, will always want to try and qualify what exactly God source creator is. Uh, but from my experience and from what I've seen, it's more, there are many beings helping in the form of beings, um, helping us cross, grow, expand, and all of that. And we are also a very big part of assessing how our lifetime was and being the judge, so to speak. So I hope that helps answer your question. All right. Now the next one is once a person dies, is there only one place they go? Does everyone go to the same place, no matter their beliefs or behavior? Now, this is really neat because I had asked this question to spirit years ago. And one of the most beautiful answers was that and it was Buddha and Jesus actually that answered this question. And they showed me several slides all entering the same pool. So there were slides all around the pool and they all entered the same pool. And they said, essentially, regardless of your belief, it all leads back to source. It all leads back to the same pool. So people will take on different journeys throughout their incarnation based on lessons they're going to learn. And then we all essentially return back to love, return back to that space of bliss, joy, the place that is so much more the other side. Now, what the other side can look like can also vary so much for everyone, depending on, again, what their soul wants, because it's not limited. It's not a, a physical place as we understand physicality in 3D. And I know that could be an obvious answer. 
because of course it's not third dimensional, but I say that because I have seen from other people, from when I've seen the soul come forward in a reading, some are busy fishing on a river. Some are resting in a tent by a lake. Some are over this hill that I see sometimes when spirits go to a place beyond what I can access or I can see. There's a deeper place of working, organizing. Those that are really helping humanity grow and expand are on the other side of this hill. And so some go straight to working and helping humanity. Uh, others expand into the cosmos. I have seen some spirits when they cross over, are, they are so happy to be out of their body that they are just expanded energy merging with the vastness of the universe, of the cosmos, of space. And they're like, I am merging with stars. It's really beautiful to see. And I've also seen other spirits when they cross over, they're fascinated with how they can merge with anything on this planet. They can merge with the energy of a tree, of a flower, with an animal, with air, with water. They are unlimited by the form that they just had, that being a human form. And so they're exploring the ways in which their energy can merge. Now, my experience when I had my NDE, I landed at this beautiful green grass kind of summer barbecue picnic area which was so comforting and so heartwarming and home feeling to me. But what's funny is if you would have asked me before my near-death experience, what I would think heaven would look like, I would have told you it's a tropical beach because when I do my meditations, I go to this tropical beach. But when my soul landed on the other side, it was all about home, family, connectedness and warmth. And that was this kind of summer barbecue like setting. So it really can be so many different things but even with all those different visuals, it is returning to a place of love, of source, of home. And if I could leave you with one last thought is when a person dies, they go home. The feeling of the other side is so much like home. It is like the feeling you get when you've been on vacation and you finally come home and you, you walk into your house and you recognize the smells and, you know, the colors of your home and feeling of your bed it's this home frequency that's the closest thing we have to the feeling of the other side the other side is like home so i hope that helps answer that okay the next question is what is the best way when feeling lost in the moment to contact spirit or guides this is a great question because we so often you know with the worlds of changes we've been having in this in this human experience here, we have had to maneuver the feelings of being lost over and over and over again in many different ways, because we have seen so much change happening and we still will be that this is a really common thing. So I love this question came up. Now, one of the best things I find is to realize or conceptualize communicating with your spirits your spirit guides the same way you would a friend, a trusted friend or confidant. You would actually phone up your friend and have a conversation with them, fill them in on what's been going on, how you're feeling and so on. And so what I find really helps me is when I'm having those moments of really, you know, questioning what's going on, feeling not lost, not seeing my direction, I will sit and talk with spirit or go for a walk or drive, but I'll speak out loud because one thing that happens when we speak out loud is not only are we getting the information, but the energy out of our body by expressing it in sound, that's a really valuable thing. But we're also hearing, hearing ourselves speak. And there's a huge validation when we hear ourselves speak. It's like we're being heard by ourselves, and that's actually really important. So that's one bonus. But when we speak out loud, we don't have to, we can speak in our minds and spirit hears us. Absolutely. But sometimes speaking out loud helps us feel like we're being you know, heard, as I said. But in that moment is to really share with spirit how exactly you're feeling, what you're coming up against, where you're feeling lost, and then asking them for a sign to come in to show that they're around somehow. And so truly explaining it like you would to a friend is so valuable. And then really be open to how they can respond. Because sometimes we want them to respond very specifically and they may not be able to in that way. And so really open to how they may respond. And that could be 
say in the morning, you have a big conversation with them. You're at your wits end. You've hit a roadblock. You're like, I don't know what to do. I am lost. And then that evening you're making dinner and the song comes on the radio and there's an energy with that song. And for some reason it catches your awareness of these three key words in the song and you feel this warmth come over your body. That can be an energy of reassurance and an answer from your guides. But if we kind of dismiss it and we're like, ah, oh, no, that was just a random song. There's no way that could be, you know, the answer or the thing. Then we miss the ways in which they can communicate, right? Or maybe uh, after you finish your big spiel with your guides and you've exhausted it all out, you've gotten it all out, maybe you cried it all out. And then you look at the clock and it's 11, 11. That's, that's a thing, right? Like that's a key thing. So notice the synchronistic things that come after you express your feelings to your guides because there's a lot of value in that, but definitely connect with them. It's as easy as talking to them. You can definitely go into a deeper meditation if you're able to in that moment. Um, but sometimes it's really hard to go into that spiritual practice when we're feeling really lost, which is why I really want to emphasize that just simply going for a walk, going for a drive and talking to them does allow them to hear you. Absolutely. They are always looking out for us and listening. So please know that they hear you and feel your freedom to express. All right. Next question is with ancestral healing, how can one connect with past generations to end the pain? This is fantastic. There is a lot of ancestral healing going on in the collective right now. And I love that this question is coming up because this is like, this is a conscious thing coming up for a lot of people, whether they are wanting to connect with the past generations to end the pain, or they're just realizing that awareness within self, there's a lot of this happening. So I can see that this relates to a lot of people. So some of the ways that we can connect with past generations is if you know of a specific energy, specific person in your ancestral history that you wish to connect with, you could essentially connect with them in a meditative state. You could ask for them to come forward in a dream state, especially if you're a very lucid dreamer. You could make that a communication time where you sit down and talk with them. You could write a letter to that person or that time in history in your ancest ancestral lines. Um, you could write a letter. You could also connect with a medium to see if they could actually bring that particular person forward and have a conversation with them. So those are some ways you could do it that way. But another thing that you could do is you could even go back into time through Akashic Records. And Cindy Lang is uh, one of the best readers that I know. She's on Avalon Spirit as well. So you can check her out there. But she has the ability to take you back into different times in the Akashic records to understand the event, um, the person, what's going on, and then change the energetics because essentially it's you that's doing the changing once you understand what's going on. So that would be one avenue is Akashic records. Another one could be going into a past life regression um, or any kind of spiritual hy hypnosis. And Tony Vandermerrill is really skilled at that. She's on Avalon Spirit as well in either helping you step into a past life or spiritual hypnosis into an ancestral timeline where you can, again, have communications with the energies of that time, help mend it or gain clarity uh, to change the frequency. Because anytime we go into the past, we can make an energetic ripple that changes the frequency going forward. So I hope that helps explain that, but beautiful question. I really like it. All right, now I had somebody ask, um, if light beings can tell us about any upcoming earth events, such as a solar flash. Now, what's really interesting is on Wednesday night, I have cosmic consciousness circle, and uh, we're going to be talking specifically about solar flares and or also portals. And this is to explain kind of what the sun is doing right now and help us understand how solar consciousness is helping us increase our consciousness. Now in terms, so before I jump too far, definitely check that out. If you're wanting to know more about the solar activity happening right now, check out Cosmic Consciousness this week. You definitely don't want to miss it. Okay. You can sign up for that on avalonspirit.com under Cosmic Consciousness Circle. But the solar flash, now this is interesting. I have seen this in visions of different timeline potentials. 
There were times where it was in the timeline we were currently in, but then it has shifted out. When I checked in at the time of this, it is not currently aligned at this point in our timeline. It was a strong potential, but I, at this understanding, feel that we've moved past that. But things could come up where that would be required. But honestly, I'm not feeling that in the energetics right now. We do have a big increase in solar activity, though. Solar flares, solar bursts, solar wind. Um, but I'm not at this current point seeing a solar flash happening. So that's a good thing for now. But what I do want to say, too, though, is any time with premonitions or timelines, the moment in which someone is given that vision, it is a snapshot of the highest probability, which is why if a premonition comes in of something to happen within one hour of time, that is like a really high likelihood it will happen as it was seen because there's a tiny amount of time between the vision and the event. But when there's a vision about an event farther into the future, there is so much time there for so many different variables to come into play that there is a higher probability for change, but it could still stay exactly as the snapshot is because again, that's one of the options. So that's just one thing to keep in mind when considering premonitions. Okay. But great question. All right. The next one is, do we plan for illnesses before we come here, like cancer, et cetera, or are these energy, are these energies we create when in human form? Now, this is so great because it really is a combination. Remember, when we look at the blueprint of a life, the blueprint is the desired juncture lessons. And I say juncture point as like destiny points, really significant, significant lessons that wish to be learned in that lifetime. Okay, so the blueprint has some of those in there. And sometimes there can be an illness set in the blueprint or an experience. And I can use myself as an example me having really severe periods and hemorrhaging to lead me to my NDE, that was a significant juncture point. Me learning surrender through chronic illness was a significant part of my lesson. But once it was learned, I could take out that juncture, that fuse. It didn't need to be a part of my life moving forward. So there are some cases where somebody will have uh, a destiny point of an illness for a learning of something. And then from a human perspective that's a hard one to to swallow sometimes because we're like why would someone choose to want to suffer and again that's a very human response and I understand that as well that's a very true response but from the soul perspective the soul understands that we learn from all things not just good things we learn and gain wisdom from tough things and sometimes for example someone who perhaps in one lifetime struggled with cancer they struggled and struggled and struggled, and then they went to the other side, but they came back into another life then with a strong desire from a little kid to be a doctor and always wanted to be a doctor and they wanted to help people. And they became somebody who perhaps revolutionized cancer treatment, but really it was because they had a past life in which they really struggled. So there's pieces that pertain to our soul lessons over many lifetimes. So some lifetimes we will have an illness to give us an understanding of something, a piece of soul wisdom. Now, at the same time, though, sometimes illness can be due to free will choices, because again, we have the soul blueprint, which is destiny. But then we have, when we come into human form, we have free will as a human to choose how we want to do things, how we want to react to things, how we want to treat our bodies. And that free will plays equal parts to destiny. So for example, and I'll take a very, very generalized example, but someone who really mistreats their body poorly, you know, poor diet, lack of water, no sleep, stress, all this kind of stuff. Someone who does that may find they do develop illness, but maybe that illness wasn't part of their divine blueprint, but it was a direct result of their free will choices as a human, right? So it really is a combination. Now, our free will choice can also dictate the depth of a destiny experience we have. Sometimes if we're really good with our choices and we're really honest and authentic with ourselves, we can shorten the experience of that destiny point sometimes. Um, 
And sometimes we can make it much longer than it needs to be. Again, it's a balance of the two. All right. Okay. Next question is, my mom passed away very unexpectedly. I'm just wondering, can she hear me? I will talk to her and still send her messages. I guess, do they hear and see what we write and say to them? I feel like sometimes I receive her answers in my mind. This is beautiful because I think we all ask this question when we lose somebody, can they hear me? Can they really hear me? And the answer is yes, absolutely yes they hear you. And I, like I said, I've heard this from so many different spirits when they pass and cross over is they hear you. And usually when shortly after they pass, they're around quite often and they're very close, but even when they, you know, are really dealing with their full transition, maybe they're in a resting place for a while. They still hear you. They absolutely hear you. Sometimes they can answer in your mind. So those times where you think, what was that? Was that me? Did I make that up? Oftentimes they bring in an energy, which does answer in the mind. Uh, so that one does take a little bit to get used to, but absolutely please trust that um, your mom can hear me. And I would imagine she'll try and answer messages in many different ways as best she can. And sometimes spirits know how to do that really well. And sometimes they have to kind of learn how to do that, but their desire is often to answer us if they can in some form, we just have to really stay open to the ways in which they're answering. Okay, next question. Okay, last one for today, and then I will answer more on the next show. Um, I do wanna say though, for those that are listening next week, I will be doing the October energy update. So part two of the Q and A will come the week after that. Okay, just to keep that in mind. Okay, last one is, do walk-ins remember their past lives when they walk into a body? Would they remember relatives, friends from their previous lives? So this is really interesting. Um, and again, there isn't a concrete answer because it's very varied depending on what is needed for that soul coming in and also depending on how easily they're able to transition into their new form. So a walk-in can come in and remember their past lives. Only usually if it's pertinent to their journey now, does it serve them to remember the life before or not? Other times, depending on what that life was and their reason, what their reason is for coming in can determine whether they have a working memory of it or not. Sometimes they may exhibit a soul resonance to different family or friends, but they may not know why. So they may feel really close to somebody, but not be able to know not be able to truly understand why. Um, a walk-in is a new consciousness to that being that, or sorry, to that body. So that's one thing to remember is when the walk-in soul comes in, it's a new soul that is changing places with the natal soul. Now this doesn't just happen by chance. It is, it is an agreed upon thing. So please, I don't want anyone to worry like, oh my gosh, is someone going to shove my soul out of my body and take over? No, if this is an agreed upon thing. And what will happen sometimes is the natal soul will come in for a certain amount of time. The one that was born into the body grew through childhood and adolescence. And then they will leave at a certain point and another one will walk in. And so sometimes the transition of a walk-in can be very seamless, although there is an adjustment period because you're not stepping in as a soul into a baby body that can learn the world around you. You're stepping into a fully functioning adult body and, and brain. So there's certain amounts of adjustment that need to happen. So sometimes there's a little while for the person to kind of figure out their flow as well. Sometimes the walk-in can happen over a period of time. So you could have the natal soul still somewhat connected and the walk-in soul stepping in, but the two can actually share space sometimes for a year two years. I've seen that happen before until the other soul, the natal soul finally let go. And sometimes that'll happen so that the natal soul can essentially kind of show the walk-in soul around their life, give them understandings of kind of what's going on, kind of be that uh, intermediary. Although that can also be a really confusing time for the person because they're like, which consciousness is this? I feel two totally different parts. Um, so that can happen, but it doesn't always happen that way. Um, and let's see, what else could I say about that? 
they may be able to remember more if they were to do any kind of spiritual hypnosis. If that person is curious about why they walked in and they don't know, and they don't have a working memory, spiritual hypnosis being regressed into the higher realms of energy could help explain some of that. So that might be an avenue of discovery. Um, again, Tony Vandermeer is fabulous and so gifted and qualified in doing that. So I would check that out. Um, yeah, I think that's the best way I can explain it without knowing the details of the specific situation. Because again, it, it's very varied. Some walk-ins can happen kind of overnight and it's instant natal souls completely gone. And the walk-in comes in fully functional. Um, most of the times with the walk-in, just to give some people some context, there will be some significant differences in the way that they carry themselves, maybe in the way they dress in their belief systems. Um, and what they're really connected to, like somebody may be really religious at first, and then after their walk-in, they are very deeply connected to Buddhism, say, or maybe even just earth energy. They just feel grounded into Gaia, and to them, that is their new connection to source. Like, there's usually some really significant changes, so I hope that kind of helps explain it. All right. Okay, one more. Sorry, one last one. Let's just finish this off here. Last one, super last one. Okay, so this one is, what is the best advice to someone who has recently had a spiritual awakening? I had a major event happen a few months ago and I believe in the woo now. What steps should I take now to keep learning and growing? I'm lost. Okay, this is fabulous. And I, I think this is a great way to end today's episode. Um, one of the biggest things with when we awaken and open is we have such an expansion of consciousness that happens that it's so important that we ground. And this is something that I found myself kind of fighting tooth and nail is grounding because I wanted to spend so much time up in the higher realms, but I didn't realize that to consciously and openly spend time up there, I had to equally be tethered down to earth. I needed to ground into earth. So I would say one of the first things to do is get a really good grounding practice so that you can balance the energies of open opening with grounding into your human experience. So that can be going for a walk in nature. That can be meditating and connecting to mother earth. That can be, you know, listening to drum music and stomping your feet. It can, there's so many different ways that it can be, but explore, uh, grounding practices and make that a daily routine. If you can, it will bring a lot of calming energy and stability to the mind as we open rapidly as well is to balance it with 3d reality checks. And what I mean by that is awakening does change your perspective of 3d reality. Absolutely. And that's fair, but something we have to remember when we have a spiritual awakening is we have to still check in with our human selves in our human world with our daily human things, right? So sometimes it's like dive in and explore all the different consciousness things, but then take a break from it and come back to, you know, getting in your garden, playing with your kids, uh, going to a movie, watching Netflix, really 3D things so that you don't lose that connection with your humanity, because what happens sometimes is people open and expand and they love it and it makes sense. But that expanded state needs to have a blend with the human state so that the human state can catch up and grow in its consciousness, but also be able to function in the world here. Because what happens is a lot of people will have spiritual awakenings and then they feel like they can't function in society, in the world. And then essentially they want to go home. They want to go back to the other side. And what's happening is we are meant to be here at this time to awaken consciousness within being human. And so we need to find ways to tether that awakening back to here and change the frequency of what it means to be human. So finding ways to balance with 3D reality checks, staying connected to your human self is really okay and really, really beneficial. And another thing too, is to also remember with the awakening, there'll be moments of massive expansion and then moments of quiet where you kind of feel like nothing's happening. And that's when you'll question, did I make this up? Am I crazy? Did my guides all disappear? What happened? What did I do wrong? And instead of running down that tangent, remember that there are ebbs and flows 
in awakening, just like the tide comes in or a wave comes in to shore and it brings all this insight information and awakening, but then it has to also recede to then bring in another wave. So when the wave is receding, when that wave of expansive knowledge and understandings and epiphanies recedes into the quietness, be okay with the quietness and know it's just receding to make way for another wave. Because as spirit helps us awaken and open, we also need the time to recalibrate our human selves. And sometimes that's a couple days. Sometimes that can be a couple months. And so it's about really honoring the flow of it and not getting caught up when it feels like the tap is turned off. Because here's one thing. I remember spirit showed me years ago, the insights of creation. I was in Egypt and they showed me creation. They flashed creation through so fast and it was so much. My human brain couldn't keep up and it was... I didn't know what to do with it. And I basically, I couldn't even speak or have a conversation for like a day and a half after, because it was so big. And so I understood at that point why we get waves of info enough for us to recalibrate and then another wave. And then we recalibrate in another wave because it is more, it is easier on our human consciousness to catch up because if we get too much, sometimes we'll shut the whole thing down. And that's not what the universe wants. That's not what the collective energy wants. And that's not what humanity as a whole needs uh, as we grow and awaken. So again, I would say grounding practice is essential. Balancing with your 3D reality and then connecting back into 3D reality so that you're okay with those ebbs and flows of consciousness. So I will leave that with you guys for now. Thank you again so much for joining me today on the Q&A. I so look forward to answering more of these. Again, next week is going to be the October energy update, but after that, we'll jump right back in to more answers about all these great things. So thank you guys again. Do check out avalonspirit.com. And as well, again, if you're interested in the cosmic consciousness circle, check that out. It's on Wednesday night. It's going to be great. We're going into portals. We're going to solar activity. It's going to be a really neat exploration of um, our solar system and where humanity is going within it. So I'll see you guys again next week. Have an amazing day.